1 Corinthians chapter 9. If you brought a Bible this morning, you can go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to be reading out of the NIV. Did you know that you're in a race? The Apostle Paul, he wrote this letter to the Corinthians. Um, this, there was a, a group of Christians in the city called Corinth, and he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. He says, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I don't fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and I make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Let's take a moment to pray. God, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your presence here. We invite you to speak to our hearts this morning through your word and by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would bring transformation to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I want to preach to you a message that I've titled, Run to Win. Run to Win. You and I, we only get one life, and Paul admonishes us, run in such a way that you win. When the, when the Corinthians, when they would have heard or read this portion of Paul's letter, they would have immediately thought of the Isthmian Games. So there were four sports festivals in ancient Greece. Um, you probably know the name of one of them, the Olympics. <laughs> um, there's three other really big sports festivals, though, that they were second in popularity um, and prestige only to the Olympics. And of those three festivals, the Isthmian Games was one of them, and it was held in Corinth. And so... By the time Paul wrote this letter, the Isthmian Games had been going on. Uh, they ran every two years for over 600 years. So this is a huge part of their culture and something that they are all about as a city. And one of the main events was running. As a matter of fact, if you didn't know this, uh, the very first Olympic event ever was the Stadion, which was a 200-yard sprint. And the Stadion, it was the most prestigious of all the running events, of all the games um, collectively in the winner was often considered the winner of the entire games. And so in Corinth, you got to get the idea, like, they don't have NBA. Like, they're not watching the playoffs right now like some of you might be. They don't have NHL. They don't have MLB. They don't have football. They don't have any of the stuff that you are into. Um, they, they didn't have it then. There was no professional sports teams or leagues. All they had were these four huge sports festivals. And so this, like their version of Clayton Kershaw or LeBron James, it was the winners of the stadium race. And so you picture like these kids with posters on their walls. This is, I guess, before the printing press, so they probably didn't have posters. But like maybe they drew pictures of these guys that like they admired on their bedroom walls of like, you know, these, these guys that ran and won the races. And as kids, they're racing other kids in the neighborhood and they're dreaming about maybe someday winning the stadium race in the Isthmian Games and being crowned with this crown in front of this roaring crowd of people. Now, how many of you, you know, I wonder, how many, how many people go to the Olympics dreaming of silver? If you're going to train and you're going to compete and you're going to spend all the time and all the money and you're going to invest, you want to win, right? You're going for gold. And so Paul, he's writing and he's saying, run in such a way as to get the prize. Run to win. In life, go for gold. Go for the crown. Don't just run, like don't just live this life, but live in such a way that when you cross the finish line and you enter into eternity, that you'll receive the crown. We all know the story of the tortoise and the hare. The hare has the race in the bag, so he sprints ahead, and after he gets a lead, what does he do? He takes a nap. Yeah, he takes a nap, and then he wakes up to discover that he slept too long and that he lost the race. And I think for many of us, spiritually, we've had some seasons, if you've been following Jesus for any length of time, maybe you've had some seasons where you were really pursuing God. Some seasons where you're following him and you're striving to please him and there's growth and transformation and exciting stories, God stories that you have. And, but then we get distracted by a shady piece of grass underneath a tree. Could represent all kinds of different things. 
but we can get distracted by all these other pursuits or we just get tired and we want to lay down and spiritually our progress stops and we fall asleep in a spiritual sense. And I believe that for some of you this morning that in love, God is wanting to come to you and say, my son, my daughter, get up. It's time to run. We're in a race. Let's go. Let's get going. There's a finish line ahead of us. I have so much more in store for you. Let's go. Tell the person next to you, we're in a race. Tell them I'm going to beat you. (laughs) In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus told this story about a man who went on a journey. And before he goes on his journey, he calls in some of his servants and he entrusts a portion of his wealth to them. And then he leaves and he goes on his journey. And when he comes back, After a long time being away, he calls in each of his servants one by one to see what they did with the wealth that he entrusted to them. And two of the servants, two of the three, they put the money that they were given to work and they gained even more. And so, and then one of the, the the third servant, he buried his in the ground. To the two that were good stewards of what they had been given, Jesus said that the master is going to tell them in Matthew 25, 23, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. Now I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. But to the one who buried what he was given in the ground, he says, you wicked, lazy servant. What he was given was taken away from him and he was thrown outside into the darkness. God has entrusted to all of us one life. You have a certain measure of time that God has given you on this planet. You have a certain amount of money and resources that will come to you over your lifetime. You have uh, a measure of talent and gifting and abilities. You have a number of relationships and people that that are going to cross your path over your time on this earth. And when you cross the finish line and you cross into eternity, you're going to stand before God and he's going to settle accounts with you. How well did you use what you were given? And you might wonder, well, how do I use it well? Like, what does that look like? Jesus summed up all the commands in the entire Bible into two. Love God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God. Love people. In other words... No matter what your achievements are in life, if they don't have to do with loving God or loving people, then those achievements aren't going to last. But on the other hand, if you'll live your life for God, if you'll spend all that you have on him to please him and you seek to honor him and to be selfless and to love him, to love the people around you with all that's come to you, then you get to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with these few things that have come to you over this period of your life. But come now, I'm going to put you in charge of many things. I'm going to entrust a whole lot more to you if you're faithful. Come and share in your master's happiness. How many of you guys want to win that prize? I want to win that prize. If you want to hear well done, if you want to see the many things, all the treasures that are stored up for you in heaven that aren't temporary, but they're going to last forever. If you also want to hear that, Paul says, Run in such a way as to win the prize. Are you running to win the prize? So in the 2004 Olympics, they started the final round. It was the 50-meter, three-position shooting final. This guy, Matt Emmons, for the United States, he had one shot left, and he only needed to get just, just barely hit the target in order to get gold. He was so far ahead. He was three points ahead. And so he's not worried at all. And so on his final shot, Matt, he steadies himself, and he's working on staying calm, and then the time comes for him to fire, and he squeezed that trigger gently and sent the shot straight at the target. And now he's amped, right? He's like, ah, just won gold, and so he's sitting there, and you know how they have that time, like, where after the, after the athletes compete, how they're standing there, and they show them on camera, they're just standing, waiting for their score to post to the leaderboard and figuring out, okay, what the judges give me, where are we at? So he's standing there, waiting for it to post, and it doesn't post. And time is dragging on. It starts to get like awkward. And people are looking around like, What's, what happened? What's going on? And then somebody comes over finally. And they inform Matt. They said, 
you shot at the target that was one lane over from your own. He shot the wrong target, and his final shot was ruled a complete miss, and he dropped from a certain gold medal to eighth place. And this is the Olympics. So like so much work, so much skill, so much went into it, all to have it slip away because he was focused on the wrong target. And here's the thing. You and I, we each spend our lives aiming at a target. We can set all sorts of targets for ourselves. We can have health goals and financial goals and career goals and family goals and whatever goals. And we can even hit every single one of those targets that we set for ourselves. But here's the thing. If we don't aim at the target that Jesus is aiming at, we're always going to miss the mark. So what are you aiming at? What are you pursuing? What is it that you're focused on? I think too many of us, if we're honest, we're going after crowns that don't last. And I want to challenge us this morning. I believe God wants to challenge you. Go after God and after the things of God. It's like the kid who's reading the teacher's remarks on his paper. You know, good content, excellent bibliography, perfect grammar, F, wrong assignment. I don't want to stand before God and have him say, hey, great reputation. Everybody loved you. Great wealth, man, you really, you acquired a lot, you know? Great physique, you really hit it in the gym. Great career, like you really climbed that ladder. F, wrong assignment. Where are the poor people that you clothed? Where are the thirsty people that you gave a drink to? Where are the lost people that you introduced to me? Where, were, where was it that you made the investment in your relationship with me to know me and to love me? Where was your worship? Make sure you're not wasting your life aiming at the wrong target trying to ace the wrong assignment. Once you understand the assignment, you understand what God has called you to. We may not be perfect at it, but if you're running and saying, I want to I want to run this race well, I want to cross the finish line, I want to receive the crown that's going to last. How do you make sure that you win? If you want to win, there's a theme in this passage. If you look at verse 25 again, Paul writes, he says, everyone who competes in the games goes into what? Somebody say strict training. So crazy. Michael Phelps has 23 gold medals for swimming in the Olympics. Most decorated Olympian of all time. How do you reach that level? Leading up to the Olympics one year, uh, he was quoted, um, he was getting ready to compete, and his coach commented on him. Found this in an article randomly. He said, even now... Phelps trains every day, including Sundays, figuring it gives him 52 more days in a year, um, days a year in the pool than many of his competitors. In peak training phases, Phelps will swim at least 80,000 meters a week, nearly 50 miles. 50 miles of swimming in a week. That includes two practices a day, sometimes three, when he's training at altitude. And with all of that expenditure of ener- energy, listen to how he ate. Um, It's said that Michael Phelps consumes a staggering 12,000 calories each day. The average person needs only 2,000. Power lifters consume in the region of 8,000. His breakfast uh, typically consists of three fried egg sandwiches topped with mayo, cheese, lettuce, tomatoes, fried onions, toast, an omelet, porridge, three pancakes, and two cups of coffee. But then by lunch, he's hungry. His, see, this, some of you guys are feeling good. You're like, I'm actually not that bad. <laughs> I'm doing all right. His lunch usually consists of about a, 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 it consists of a pound of pasta with two ham and cheese sandwiches and approximately 1,000 calories of energy drinks. For dinner, Michael Phelps has more pasta, another pound of it with a pizza and more energy drinks. In addition to this, he'll take protein supplements to keep his muscles in top condition. Talk about strict training. I could get down with some of that. The second half, maybe. (laughs) I'm sure his competitors train, but Michael Phelps, he took his training to a whole nother level. Why 23 gold medals? To experience what others don't, you have to be willing to do what others won't. You read the stories of people that have these crazy encounters with God and the things that they're experiencing and the way they're praying for the sick and seeing them recover and they're talking to lost people about Jesus and they're responding and coming to faith and this, all these amazing things. 
It's available to you just as much as it's available to anybody else. If God did it for somebody else, he'll do it for you. He, has no, he shows no favoritism, James tells us. But you think about this strict training. What do you think that Michael Phelps did on the days that he didn't feel like training? He trained anyway, right? What do you think he did on the days that he was tired? He trained anyway. What do you think he did when the opportunities came to go hang out with friends or go do something else? He trained instead because he had a single-minded focus on gold and he knew that every day, every practice, every lap was important. He was quoted saying, I'm determined to win, eat, sleep, and swim. That's all I can do. And that's literally all he did. Think about how much time it would take to eat all that food. As Christians, the point is, is that we are to concentrate our lives on Jesus. A part-time Christian is a contradiction in terms. We must use our whole lives, every moment, everything that's been entrusted to us. God, I want to please you with this. How can I honor you? And then look at verse 26. He says, therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I don't fight like a boxer beating the air. So what he's saying is, I'm not shadow boxing. Like he's got direction. He's not aimless. He's not expending energy in all these different directions. He's focused. And then he says, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Why would Paul say, I beat my body and make it my slave? Have you ever recognized that it's not always easy to pray? You ever recognize that it's not always easy to resist sin? That it's not always easy to share about Jesus when you feel compelled to? Like there's this part of you that really wants to do it, but then there's this other part of you. You know what I'm talking about? You with me? Jesus said in Matthew 26, 41, he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So you get the picture that there's these two forces that are at work within you at all times. You have your spirit. So if you believe in Jesus, your spirit is now alive in Christ. And now you are alive and you have these desires, this longing to please God. So your spirit is the part of you that wants to please God. It's the part of you that wants to pray, that wants to share your faith, that wants to be about what God is about. And then you have your flesh. It's the earthly, the carnal part of you, the, the part of you that is at war with your spirit, the part of you that when your alarm goes off to read the Bible, you want to hit snooze. That's your flesh talking to you. It's the part of you that wants you to, to step back rather than step forward when God's asking you to step forward. It's the part of you that wants to take a nap underneath a tree in the middle of the race. If you're going to win the prize, if you want to hear well done, good and faithful servant, then you have to beat your flesh into submission. Not literally. Please don't go hurt yourself. This isn't permission to do that. Um, that word actually, flesh in the original Greek is the word sarx, and it refers to our fleshly, our sinful nature. That sinful part of us. So not our physical body. Um, but what he's talking about is, I'm going to strike a blow to that part of me. So whatever you feed gets bigger, right? So if you feed your spirit man, and you keep walking and you yield to your spirit man and those godly desires that are inside of you, it's going to grow and you're going to find yourself walking in that more and more. But if you yield to your flesh and the sinful natures, it's going to grow and it's going to overtake your life. We've all been there. We've all sinned. We've all been caught up in it, right? And so what Paul's saying is, I'm going to strike a blow to this side. I'm going to starve and deprive this side of me and I'm going to yield to the spirit. I'm not going to give in. Hebrews 11 is known as the hall of faith. And it lists like all these incredible men and women of, of God throughout history who ran their race well. And they believed God, they, they witnessed God, used them in all these amazing ways. And scripture refers to them as this great cloud of witnesses. And so I want you to imagine like right now, I want you to imagine like Noah and Abraham and Moses and Rahab and David and Samson and all these heroes of the faith that went before us, that they are in the stands of heaven now. They're watching you and I run our race. And then he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. 
For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It says, throw off. We got all these heroes of the faith. They're leaning over the railings of heaven, watching how are you going to run your race? You're going to get the prize. In light of that, throw off everything that hinders. How many of you guys have seen Olympic runners carry a backpack? As they're running. Never, right? They are, try, they're not, they don't want to have any extra weight. Like they're wearing the lightest clothes, like, have, like practically nothing. You got men that are like shaving their legs just to be more aerodynamic. Like they're doing everything they possibly can. And some of you, you're in the race, but you're carrying things that are hindering you. You've got these pursuits or these other things that you're concerned about that really have nothing to do with your race. And they're hindering you. And Paul's saying, throw that stuff off. And he says, oh, and that sin that so easily entangles, it's like your shoes are untied and you are trying to run and you keep tripping and stumbling all down the track. Get rid of that stuff. And then he says, run with perseverance. How many recognize that this is not a sprint, but this is a marathon that we're in? This isn't about, hey, this week, let's really go after God. This is about for the rest of my life, as long as there's breath in my lungs, I want to run this thing well. I'm going to run with endurance, with perseverance, And then he says, as we're running, fixing our eyes, where? On Jesus. How many know that Jesus ran to win? You know, we just celebrated Easter, and I've been reflecting these past couple weeks on Jesus' last week of life. And, you know, they, they call it Holy Week, but they also call it something else. You know what they call that last week? Anybody? Passion Week. They call it Passion Week, and I've always thought that's kind of like a weird thing to call it, like the passion of the Christ, because I don't know about you, but when I hear the word passion, I think of like somebody that's excited. Like I think of like enthusiasm and like, oh yeah, this this desire and this, you know, somebody who's stoked and just amped on something, right? And then when you see like the passion of the Christ and you see the cover, it's like, that doesn't look like passion to me. But I recently came across this definition of passion that I loved, I think this is a much more accurate definition of passion. Passion is the degree of difficulty that we are willing to endure in order to achieve the goal. Your passion can be measured by the amount of difficulty that you are willing to endure in order to receive the prize. What was Jesus' goal? Right there in the scripture it said, for the joy set before him he endured the cross. For the joy set before him, for the eternal prize that was awaiting him after he rose from the dead. He wanted to finish the race that the Father sent him to run. And so he endured, right? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He he endured the crown of thorns being pushed down on his head so much that it pushed into the thorns going into his skin, pressing up against the skull. Incredibly painful. He endured being mocked and spit on, punched in the face. He was scourged. He was was tied to a post, naked, and then he was whipped. And on the end of this whip, there were nine tails that were made of leather. At the end, there were pieces of like bone or rock or sharp objects that were designed and carved in such a way that when they hit your body, it would grab the flesh, cut it, and rip it off. And he endured all of it. He endured his beard being ripped out of his face. And he could have tapped out at any moment, but he was running to win. He endured the pain of nails being driven through his hands and through his feet. He endured it when they lifted the cross up vertical and they set it in its spot. And all the weight came down on those nails. He endured hanging there in shame with blood and flies as the whole world is watching and those that are next to him are hurling insults at him and he's watching the Roman guards roll dice to see who's going to get to keep his clothes after he's dead. And he had legions of angels at his disposal. He could have stopped it all with just a word. They would have come and rescued him. But he didn't. He endured it all because he was running to win. 
His heart and his focus was on the prize, on the joy set before him. I know if I just endure this, there is joy before me. And as a result, where is he now? Come on. The Father has has exalted him. There is no one above him. He's been given the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is enjoying the reward of his endurance, of finishing the race that the Father sent him to run. See, many of us, we want the prize, but we don't want to sacrifice anything. I know I'm hitting hard this morning. But the reality is, is that sometimes we forget that in order to receive the prize, it requires strict training and great passion. Great passion. A willingness to endure. Are you willing? Like sometimes I find myself like, it's like embarrassing that I don't even want to sacrifice sleep or watching TV to pray. Are you willing to endure those minor discomforts? Are you willing to endure rejection to stand up for Jesus? Are you willing to to fast and deny your flesh to strengthen your spirit? Are you willing to endure the difficulty of fighting sin and just stop giving into it over and over again? Are you willing to start fighting? How great is your passion? Because again, I don't care how much, like, I don't care how loud you talk about God. I don't care how much enthusiasm you can work up in your voice. That's not passion. It's how much difficulty are you willing to endure to attain the prize? How much are you willing to sacrifice? Can I encourage you this morning? Will you go all in to win the eternal prize? Will you see that all of your, there has to be a perspective shift that says, I see that now all of my time and all of my money, all of my resources, all of my talent and gifts and abilities, all of my relationships, they actually aren't mine. They were all entrusted to me from my master. They are on loan from him. And the day is going to come when I'm going to stand and have to give an account for how I use those things. And so I want to strive with everything. This isn't a thing about being afraid. This isn't walking through life being afraid about being punished. This is an opportunity for us to store up treasure in heaven. And so I'm going to strive with all the strength that God gives me. Because God knows I can't do anything on my own strength. i got to get alone with him. i got to receive his strength. But with all the strength that he gives me, I'm going to spend everything that I've got to love him and to love others. Anything that hinders has got to be shoved aside. Those shoelaces tripping me up, that sin has got to go. You know, when I was a kid, I dreamed about being an NBA player until I was like 13. And then I realized I'm not built for the NBA. Um, The good news is that following Jesus and achieving the prize isn't just possible for one or an elite few. Anyone who takes what they've been given and decides I'm going to run to win can win. I want to encourage you, you have it all in you to win. Just like LeBron has it in him to win. Did you know, by the way, the Lakers are pl- they're paying LeBron right now $97.1 million over these two years to have him play. They set him up to win, right? He's got access to like the best gyms on the planet, the state-of-the-art training facilities and equipment. He's got the best coaches and the recovery stuff available to him. He's got all the equipment. He's got everything he needs to kill it on the court, and they're paying him $97 million. And imagine this with me. Imagine that he, de- he refuses to play. And he decides with all of that, he's just going to sit on the bench for an entire season. That would blow our minds and it would make headlines, wouldn't it? But consider this. God paid much more for you than $97 million. He gave the life of his son on the cross so that you could be forgiven. So that the stone of your sin could be rolled away and you could have access to God. And then he caused his Holy Spirit to come and dwell inside of you. He gave you resurrection power living on the inside. You have access to the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And then he declared, he declares to you as he declared to his disciples in Luke 10, 19, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. You are set up to win. Scripture says that you've been given everything that you need for life and godliness. God's entrusted to you and I so much. Don't sit on the bench and waste your life. God didn't roll the stone of your sin away. 
and call you to life so that you could just float through life how you were doing it before. God didn't cause his Holy Spirit to come and live inside of you so that you could live the same way that your neighbor does who has no faith in God. God didn't save you for average. God destined you to win. He saved you because he said, I I choose that one, I love you. Maybe you didn't know this, but before the creation of the world, I chose you. And I formed you in your mother's womb and I set you apart so that you could run this race. There's so much he has in store for you. Will you stand with me? When you realize that you don't deserve to be here, like, I shouldn't be here. I was the worst sinner, the most broken, the least gifted. Yet by God's incredible grace, he called me. It still blows me away. Like, I'm the most unlikely. I'm the one that I looked in the mirror and I'm like, no way could God ever use me. And I'm sure a lot of other people looked at me and thought the same thing. Yet, God chose me and he saved me and he filled me with his spirit and he gave me purpose. How could I take all of that and go back to living for myself? That was the Apostle Paul's mentality. We read just a few chapters later. He says this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, for I'm the least of the apostles. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, not I, but the grace of God that was within me. He's saying, I don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted, because of my sin, because of my stuff in my past. I don't deserve to be here. But God, because of his great love for me, in the riches of his grace and in his mercy, he called me still, and he chose me to partner with him. And he says, God's grace came to me and his grace was not without effect. In other words, he was not gracious and then I just sat there and absorbed it and sat on the bench. But he said, no, I chose because of God's grace toward extended to me, I chose to run harder than anybody else. I became the hardest worker in the room. I'm pursuing God. I'm gonna be the most hungry for him than anybody else. I'm gonna go after him like nobody else will. I'm gonna become all things to all people so that I can try to find some common ground with every person that I meet just that I might win some to Jesus. I gotta cross the finish line and I wanna receive the crown. Can we adopt that mentality? God, I don't wanna waste my life. We close your eyes for a moment. God, we thank you for your immeasurable grace and your love and your kindness toward each of us. God, we recognize that we only get one shot at this race. And we want to live it well. God, we want to run it well. And God, I'll be the first to confess that it's hard. I see a lot of trees and I see a lot of shady pieces of grass that I'm tempted to run off off course, God, often. And I, I just pray that you would forgive me, God, for the times that I drift, the times that I become complacent. God, forgive me for the times that I turn to other things and empty pursuits and trying to run around carrying my backpack, tripping over my laces. And I thank you that even in the middle of that, that you don't abandon me, that you don't abandon us, but in your love and your patience and your grace, you walk with us and you help us throw off those things that hinder so that we can finish this race. God, I pray for every person here that you would speak to us, Holy Spirit, right now. Would you just prayerfully consider right now where you're at? Do you need to adjust your target? God, show us where we might be aiming at the wrong things, trying to ace an assignment that's the wrong assignment. (laughs) God, others of us, maybe we need to, we've got the right target, but we don't have discipline. We're not, we're not strict in our training. We just are kind of whatever about it. God, I pray that you would show us where you're asking us to bring discipline into our lives. God, show us the hindering things that need to be thrown off. God, show us the sin that we need to be serious about fighting and getting rid of. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to speak to us. We want to win this race. We want to receive the crown. We want to hear well done, good and faithful. Thank you.
Why don't you just take a moment to respond between you and God right now, and then we'll take a minute to worship.